Hey everyone, welcome to Dreadnought Mondays. Thank you for tuning in. Today we're joined by Jason Hewlett. Jason, thank you for taking the time to be here today. I know you got a busy schedule, so thank you for cutting out a little slice to be on here, and I'm looking forward to it. Uh, for those that don't know you, I'm sure there's not many, but uh, for those that don't, uh, would you mind giving a little introduction about yourself and who you are, what you do? Sure, Kenny. Thanks for having me. And I'm sure there are plenty of people who have no idea who you're talking to right now. <laughs> <laughs> and that's fine with me. Uh, yeah, my name's Jason and I am a keynote speaker. I'm an author. I'm an entertainer. And I've been doing that for 20 years. And uh, I make a living on stages around the world. And uh, during 2020's pandemic, have had to make a huge shift in my business to make it so that I can go virtual, which has been quite fascinating of a you know, of a trick for me. So yeah, th that's my world. And I'm, I'm a father with a, a very beautiful, wonderful wife, Tammy. And then we have four kids between the ages of nine and 14. And that 14 year old, she's uh, almost 15 going on 36. So I'm very grateful for the fun life we have in quarantine world. You know, it's good, man. That's, that's awesome. Yeah, I've got a a seven-year-old who thinks he's uh, 27 and knows everything. <laughs> no, exactly. this is how you do it. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Um, what got you started in, you know, performing on stage, being keynote, entertainer, the whole package? I know in one of, some of your videos, you kind of talk about this a little bit, and you do the, the whole facial motions and the eyebrows and everything. I can't do anything like that yet. <laughs> <laughs> it works well only for the viewers. If you're if you're not watching this on YouTube and just listening on, on the podcast, you got to look at the YouTube, right, Kenny? <laughs> That's right. And and I'm gonna drop a link. I'm gonna find that video and drop a link to it so that uh, people know exactly what I'm referencing as well as what you just did. <laughs> yeah, man. I started my performing and career. I think probably when I was five years old, I mean, I was, you know, making people laugh at school. I became known as the kid with the big mouth that could do funny things with my face. I could do voices of other people, especially the teachers in the class. And, and then eventually celebrities, you know, like Pee Wee Herman. <laughs> Hello, everybody. <laughs> and so I became known as that guy. And then I didn't get paid to be on a stage until about the year 2000. And so I've been at this for 20 years. And that's been my full-time career. I started as a Las Vegas musical artist doing impressions of other people. So that, that's like if you've seen an Elvis Presley wannabe or impersonator, that's what you know those guys do. I was able to impersonate really well Ricky Martin, the Live and La Vida Loca guy, and Elton John. And so I would be on stage as both of those guys at different times, and people didn't even know it was the same guy. It's for a show called Legends in Concert. That's how my career got started. And then I morphed it from there from two characters into about a hundred characters where I would either dress up or just change my voice or face and do different songs for everywhere from the Bee Gees to Jim Carrey to a Velociraptor from Jurassic Park and came up with a one man show of comedy and music that has uh, sustained my career for many years until I became a keynote speaker who, you know, uh, what I do with that is I'm still doing the entertaining stuff, but as a way to open the heart to learning and how we can teach people about their signature moves, that everyone has a voice, that we all have a promise to keep in this world, in our business, in our lives, and, and with ourselves. So that's how it all began. That's awesome. And I love the, the Jim Carrey at Subway bit. That's like one of my favorite bits. <laughs> <laughs> to right, be candid, right that, to the that one, the, the Jim Carrey one is very famous uh, as far as my signature uh, bits go, if you will. And unfortunately, it hurt me so much. I did that routine over 2000 times at shows for about 15 years until it finally got to me in my neck so painful that I was told by a doctor I had to cut certain things from my act and the Jim Carrey as the closing bit, which always got a standing ovation. Jim Carrey working at Subway. I'd whip my head around and be like, welcome to Subway. <laughs> How may I be an assistant? You know, everybody would go nuts over this impression as a way to close the show. And I eventually had to get rid of it and move to the next place. And that was sad, man, because that, like you say, that's, you know, something people don't forget if they've seen me in concert. That's awesome. I love it. You know, and um, <clears throat> it just uh, shows that you can still 
um, adapt and stuff and um, still fulfill what you want to do. Um, what was it like? You said you were started at like fifth grade or whatever, five years old. Um, I'm sure there were people that, that made fun of you and things like that or discouraged you, especially teachers. I think you mentioned some of the teachers didn't like your impressions so much. And, you know, what, what kept you going? And then what kept you going like in Vegas and on bigger stages and different places, you know, and especially I'm not a performer per se, but I'm, I can imagine, you know, Oh, that guy's really good. Or he's been here 20 years. I've been here two weeks. What do I have to follow him with kind of thing? Yeah. So what would all of that? Well, what what kept me going, I think as a, as a kid, as a five-year-old, you know, people were laughing and uh, you know, eventually I was like, Hey, they're laughing. It's great. And then, and then you start to think, well, are they laughing at me or with me? And that became kind of this self-consciousness moment as a child, you know, to want to be taken serious for the things I wanted to say. But uh, at the, then as I got older, I realized, you know, it's okay to be the person who makes everyone laugh. And, and even if the teachers are like, hey, don't do that. I found out that, you know, some of the teachers thought it was cool. A lot of them didn't. But there was one teacher in third grade. He, his name was Mr. O'Loughlin. And Mr. O'Loughlin said to me, hey, you know, you're kind of ruining the class. He pulled me out in the hallway and said, you're ruining the class. You're making everyone laugh during my time when I'm trying to teach. And he said, you know, you're the leader of the class. And I said, I'm not a leader of the class. He said, yeah, you are. Because really, Kenny, I was not a good student. I didn't have good grades. I was just trying to get by. And he said, Jason, you are the leader of the class because you can make everyone laugh. Whenever you, you know, disrupt the classroom, they're all focused on you. Uh, and so he said, I'll give you time at the end of the class if you'd like to put on a show. And if you can be quiet for a whole day, then that would be a really neat thing, wouldn't it? And I was like, yeah. And it took me about two months till I was quiet for a whole day <laughs> uh, to finally get to do my act. And so that's where it all began for me was to have one teacher that saw it, not as a problem to put me in the hall, not as a light to stamp out but rather as a gift and something good that I had about me. And that was in third grade when that happened. And, and through the years as I've gone about, you know, having success or failure or both, uh, even in Las Vegas, when people would say, hey, I, I remember one time the producer saw me in my Ricky Martin leather pants and outfit and said, hey, you know, you're too fat for this part. You need to lose about 10, 20 pounds and, you know, start to muscle up. I was shocked that someone would tell me that because I was pretty svelte, I thought at the time. And, and so, you know, lots of people are gonna knock us down, sometimes with the coach or a team member or maybe a manager at work, even a spouse, a partner can be like that where they, they knock us down, make us feel bad. And of course, it's, it's part of life to take that in and then say, well, if it's truth, and if I do watch the video and I do look a little bit pudgy for my Ricky Martin impression, what do I need to do about that? I'm grateful they helped me with that. But then an, until it became kind of more of an abusive thing where they were like, you got to lose weight every time we see you, you know, then it was eventually like, okay, I got to get out of here. I have to keep a promise to myself to not be ruled by this crazy person. And so that's where uh, sometimes you have to take a leap of faith and go into business for yourself or move on in the journey of relationships in life if things aren't going well. And so that's how I would, uh, I would approach it. Keeping a promise to self, very important. I like that. And it's, it's so, so simple yet not always so easy. You know, keeping that, that promise to yourself and whatnot, whatever the situation, relationship, um, circumstance may be, you know, um, and I think that's very cool. Um, we need more teachers like that, that, that see that talent for what it is and be able to um, appropriately encourage people to um, expand on that talent, to grow that talent, develop that talent in a positive light, you know, not just shut it down. And, you know, um, well, how would you think your life might be different if that teacher just said, you need to knock it off or you're going to the principal's office kind of thing? <laughs> Life would be different for sure. I, I'm, I'm positive I would have eventually found my way to where I needed to be, which is where I am now. But I'm, I'm certain it would have taken a little bit longer. Luckily, I wasn't in trouble, trouble. I was just kind of loud and out of control. Uh, I guess I should have been medicated to some form or fashion. My parents would not allow it. 
And so they, they allowed my creativity to flow free and then they just punished me when I got home, you know? <laughs> but I'm grateful for parents that saw a light in me and not just something that was an annoyance, which it really was. I mean, I was an annoying kid. And I eventually learned that through doing those voices and faces and comedy and music and all the things that I've learned to do, that it actually lent itself to leadership because I was elected to be a student body officer. I was the president of my high school. Like those kind of things lent to that because in the performance and, and in becoming well-spoken and those types of things, then I could say certain things a certain way and it would actually bring everyone together. And so I found out that I did have leadership skills. It was just a matter of partnering with the teacher and saying, okay, you have your job, I have my job. My job is to make them laugh, but I'll do it at the right time. And I had a nice give and take with uh, pretty much all of my teachers from third grade on. Kind of interesting, because Kenny, I, I didn't do well in school, like I said. Eventually it caught up to me, and I had to do ninth grade two times. And that's okay, I, I call it an encore, if we will, from you know the showbiz world. I just did a ninth grade encore. And I'm grateful that I had that opportunity to catch up because by ninth grade, things were just so far behind for me. I had to repeat, went to a new school, and then I blossomed because the teachers saw the talent there and my desire to be a good person, not just be an annoyance, and uh, made the honor roll and those kind of things. It really transformed my life to have that chance to be held back. Thank you, yeah. Um, it it kind of makes me think of the analogy of like um, a slingshot, you know, you're you're pulled back a little bit to be launched forward on that um, trajectory path. Uh, Beautiful. Points that uh, I wanted to talk about that uh, you brought up, you know, is that that teacher, that give and take with that teacher has, you know, maybe it started with that teacher, maybe it was already in you, I'm not sure, but it's um, developed into, you know, like you mentioned in your introduction, you're now a keynote in helping others, you know, um, realize and establish their their um, passion, their purpose, and helping them progress as well. So I think it's kind of cool how it's um, carried on and um, done a, a 180, if you will. Now you're projecting, you're the, the teacher per se, you're taking on that teacher role. Now if you wouldn't mind talking about that a little bit and how that's impacted you and what feedback and um, have you had people come up to you, oh, thank you so much for that, you know, 10 years later or things like that? Yeah, yeah, Kenny, I love the idea, the analogy of the slingshot. And yes, I, I am now the teacher. I find it fascinating, especially the other day I was speaking to 100 teachers. And then I announced that I didn't go to college and I was held back in ninth grade. And they're looking at me like, <gasps> you know, <laughs> but when, <laughs> when we discover that which we're meant to do, we share it with the world we can magnify our great gifts unlike anyone else. And so we need to share that which makes us great. And uh, that, that doesn't have to be just through a college degree per se. And so I'm grateful for the ability to still be a teacher even though academically things weren't so hot at the time. And yeah, you know, whenever I've spoken and people have started to learn and discover themselves even better, it's really a wonderful, beautiful thing. And that really feels like my life purpose is not just to spread joy, but to help others find their joy. And so that's why I've written The Promise to the One as my book and, and other things that have been happening. But yeah, I was, uh, I was at an event a few weeks ago and there have been a few live events that I've gotten to do during this pandemic time. A lady came up to me, beautiful woman, and she said, hey, when you did that one routine of the raptor, the you know, that I do, and she goes, that's when I knew I knew who you were during your presentation. Because she said, you came and spoke at my sixth grade, you know, at my school. <laughs> and I was like, and here she is, a beautiful woman now. And, you know, it's just funny to think that when we're talking to kids, which I've spoken to hundreds of thousands of youth. In fact, after we record this podcast, I'm speaking to uh, leaders from around America, which I'm so excited to talk to them, thousands of them, in fact, on a big conference. And I think, you know, 
somebody can see me in elementary school and still remember it when they're all grown up and then now they're teaching their children what I taught them. And they, they remember the pieces of things like me doing a raptor or a stupid silly face or a funny voice. And then they go, you know, I know what I have, my unique gifts. I need to share it with the world because Jason Hewlett taught me that. And it's not a new concept, Kenny, obviously. I mean, this goes back to biblical times, you know, Matthew 25 and the parable of the talents and all that. But when we look at the way that we influence the world, it's through our voice. It's through our signature moves. It's by us keeping a promise to share that which makes us uniquely great. Absolutely. And something that I've learned, you know, and opened my eyes more is your, your talents can be being a passionate person, being compassionate, being a listening ear. You know, those are just as valuable in their place as anything else, you know. So um, thank you for sharing that. Um, another um, thing I wanted to jump on is what is it like, you know, you mentioned a minute ago that uh, your, your parents let your creativity roam and stuff and they were teaching you that and whatnot. And now you being a parent, what is that like having the, that role, move, moving into that role with your kids and um, with also with what you do for a living, you know, I'm sure your, your kids are like, they, they know me as your dad's uh, the raptor guy or whatever, you know, I'm, I'm guessing you get a lot of that or similar type things from your kids at school or whatever. <laughs> yeah, it's certainly changed, uh, you know, the, the, the roles in life. It's funny how it goes. I mean, here I was 20 years ago with no kids. Now here we are 20 years down the road. We've got teenagers and life is amazing. I'll tell you, this is prime time is what I call it. I love it. And uh, it's, it's really interesting, like you said, as you segued into this portion of this, because, you know, where I was talking about our voice and being heard, et cetera, you talked about compassion and listening and all of those other aspects. And that is exactly what we want to teach our children. We want to teach anybody that we're around that everybody's uniqueness is what matters, is that they share it. And so if you're a great listener, then be the great listener. If you're, uh, you know, if you're more behind the scenes, nobody can be in the front of the stage without having everyone else behind the scenes. So everybody has their place and their purpose. It makes it so that the show must always go on. And yeah, as a dad with these children, it's really amazing to watch them grow up, find their signature moves and, Really, as a parent, my role is not only just to make sure they don't accidentally kill themselves by walking in the street without you know, looking both ways, but to equally not mess them up by not getting in their way. You know, they're going to find their talents. They're going to discover their gifts, and they're going to have to make mistakes and experiences. And so, really, I'm here to make sure that they are provided for and that they know that they're loved, but they're going to go off and do their own thing their own way. And as a parent, when I see them do something well, to point it out and say, that is so great you did that. And if you're a parent and you're listening and you're thinking, how can I parent better? I found that just by recognizing when somebody does something well in your home, to point it out, let them know. That was so great the way that you read that or how you kept your promise to us to be here on time or that you follow through on your commitment to do the dishes tonight without being asked. Those types of things are a big deal because most of the time as parents, we lean into the what you need to fix mode, <laughs> what needs to be different mode. And all we're talking about is weaknesses and, and what's not happening that's correct and how they should fix everything. And I know I've gotten into that as well when things look like they're just not going right. Imagine if we lean instead into what they're doing right and letting them realize that those are part of their gifts that they can expound upon becomes their signature moves and eventually their promise to the world. I love that. You know, and it's so easy to fall into that, uh, that, um, that other, you know, that you're doing it wrong. You know, this is not the way it's done things like that, or you messed up or this goes over here. You know, I've, I've done that several times as being a parent myself. You know, something that I've tried to do over the last few years is, okay, you know, you, because uh, my son has certain interests and stuff, so I, I try to, instead of shutting it down completely, I'm like, okay, um, let's do that over here. Kind of like what you talked about with your teacher, you know, this is time for this activity or this 
whatever, you know, it's schoolwork now, but then you can have time for this or whatever, you know, instead of completely shutting it down and whatnot. So um, thank you for bringing that up. Um, I appreciate that. <clears throat> um, sorry, I just lost my train of thought here. <laughs> That's all right. I mean, I just wanted to say thanks for pointing that out that way. You know, what? what's really cool about being a parent is that we get that opportunity and that's what's so unique about being a parent. And if you're not a parent, then how can you be that to a neighbor or with a friend or with a peer, a spouse, a partner, you know, it could be a coworker, pointing out the good things of the coworker. Imagine that, imagine if that's what we were doing instead of like, you, you wrote this wrong, you did this email poorly, you know, that's all we ever really talk about is what to improve, improve, improve. Why not, let's focus on the strengths. Let's talk about what we're good at and how we can do that more. And, and that's really how we help others discover their signature moves. And, and another word on parenting, and if, if it's okay to throw this out there, I mean, what I like to teach is if you can't figure out for yourself your signature moves, your traits, that which makes you unique and you don't know how to lean into it, well then choose this one. How about be present? How about be 100% present in every conversation? Like right now, you and me, Kenny, imagine if I was, you know, looking around and I'm on my phone while we're trying to do a podcast. That would be ridiculous. But how often do we see that at a restaurant when somebody's on a date? Or how often do we see it when, you know, moms or moms and dads are playing with the kids at the playground and they're on their phones? The phone thing is crazy. And if we can just say to ourselves, I promise to be present when I'm with my children. I'm promised to be present when I'm in the presence of another person. You know, there's, the phone's gonna be buzzing, unless it's an absolute emergency where your phone starts dinging and you're like, I, I gotta take this, okay. But how can we be present? And as quickly as the phone can connect us to the world, it can just as quickly disconnect us from our family. And so I like to say, you know, our, our promise could be that we will just be present and that's enough. Thank you, I like that. And yeah, it is, it, is, it is very tempting to, oh, somebody just messaged me or whatever, you know, and, you know, just five more minutes and then two, two hours later, you're finally coming up. <laughs> so, um, so again, thank you for bringing that up, you know, and I think it's also important to know, like you said, you know, we're not perfect parents. You've been doing it for 20 years. I've been doing it for 10 years. I make mistakes every day still. You know, but if we focus on, okay, I was able to do this part right of it, you know, I can work a little bit more on this part and stuff, you know, and that, that focus on the positive, then, then it helps create more positivity and more encouragement within ourselves and as parents too. And then, yeah. um, and that uh, trickles down to what your kids see and how your kids grow up and what, how they become parents, you know, by the example that you give. That's right. It's well said. And, you know, think about how you like to be instructed. <laughs> you know, <laughs> if you're, if, if you have a customer and somebody's like, you only did this wrong. You're like, I don't want to work with them ever again. I mean, it's really neat to get a review from somebody that you're great. It's really wonderful to get a pat on the back that the service was great in your business or that you did something well at home. And so the more that we can foster that type of, just way about ourselves and to acknowledge people, especially right now when a lot of us are under quarantine still. I mean, people aren't kind of going out and people, you know, kids aren't supposed to go to school at this time right now as the recording of this podcast. But, you know, you think about what are some of the ways that we could make it so that everybody feels acknowledged? And maybe that's just even on social media, instead of just doom scrolling all day, what if you like click like on somebody's post or, commented even or hey really go far and share it like there's all kinds of ways to make somebody's day and to and to really be fully present in their lives to make them feel better about themselves and even in a social media type of situation it it, it brings a lot of comfort to a lot of people absolutely and i can uh give you an example you know um so my wife likes decorating for the holidays and we had a bunch of decorations up in the front yard for halloween and um, somebody in the neighborhood brought us a card. No idea who it was. They didn't put their name. We didn't recognize them. No idea. Just 
the card that basically says, we like your decorations, keep up the good work. And we thought that was really awesome. You know, not only that they thought of the card or thought um, that, but they came to our house and dropped off the card. You know, so. It's a big deal. Yeah, it's, yeah, I mean, that, that's so cool. That's so cool. I mean, and you think about, that's now a story that you'll be able to hang your hat on as to why you would do the same thing for somebody else, you know, telling, telling somebody else just randomly, anonymously, hey, you're good at this, or leaving a review for a business, or writing one for a book on Amazon. That, that kind of thing really makes a difference to people. If you don't think, I mean, hey, I'm an author, I have a book on Amazon, and if you don't think the author doesn't look at the reviews like quite a bit going, I wonder if there's a review out there. It's like it changes your world that day when you go, hey, someone wrote a review. Yeah. And especially if it's good. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, it makes a world of difference. And um, that's a perfect segue. Let's um, jump into your book. What was it like writing that? You know, what, what brought it on? What encouraged it? You know, um, what kept you going from, from the naysayers? We kind of covered this with stage, but let's uh, shift over to your book a little bit here. Yeah, you know, the book was uh, quite a monster to write, to be candid, because I talk about the promise at all these corporate events that I speak at. And with the promise, there are three elements. The three elements are the audience, which are the people we serve in, in business. Then there's the family, which would be like the team at work or your family at home. And then the final promise is the promise to the one, which is the promise to yourself. I was trying to write all three of those elements into one book and it wasn't working. It, uh, for years, I tried to write it. Finally, I came to the conclusion I need to start with the promise to self. That, you know, if we can't keep a promise to ourselves, then who are we going to keep a promise to? And so writing that book in that way has really made a huge difference. And uh, yeah, it was really hard to write, Kenny. I mean, candidly, I'm like you know from what we've talked about here, you know, that whole education thing was a little tricky for me. So I've been more of a self-educated as an adult kind of guy where I'm reading voraciously all of these self-help books and inspirational works. And so writing the book was really a big deal for me. And I'm really pleased with how it turned out. There's not only the paperback version, there's the ebook, and then there's the audio book, which is me performing it, which is really fun. People really enjoy that. So it's been a big, it's been a big thing to get that book done. And it's one thing to get it self-published. It's another thing to have a publisher want to publish your book. This is a published book and I'm very excited to be working with Sound Wisdom. They're, they're the people that actually get to publish works like Napoleon Hill's Think and Grow Rich and uh, Earl Nightingale's works. And I mean, just really amazing self-help writers. And so this debuted at number one on the spiritual self-help Amazon category a couple months back. And uh, it's really turned out to be a cool thing. That's awesome. That's awesome. How did that conversation go? You know, um, maybe, maybe it didn't go in your head, but like you said, Napoleon Hill, you know, did you have any thoughts of these guys work with these big names and stuff? Who am I? Or, you know, I'll never make the cut or, people tell you that or self thoughts or things like that. Did you have any of that or experiences like that when approaching publishers? Yeah, good question. I mean, of course we all have the self doubts, especially when we were told to be excused from AP English after two days because the teacher thought you wouldn't hack it in high school. <laughs> and so I remember that story pretty vividly and, and, you know, bringing the books to publishers and them saying, well, you know, this isn't, this doesn't really fall in a certain category or you're not famous enough or whatever the situation might be. And really, I just wrote this book and maybe this would be helpful for your listeners. I wrote this book as if no one was going to read it. That really helped me a lot to just write it. And obviously you want people to read it, but I know when I've written or performed or done something that I wasn't worried about what the audience thought to a degree, like just saying, I'm just going to go for it. I'm going to go all in. Uh, when we get to that place, then we write what's real. Then we write what our true voice is. And man, that's when beautiful things show up. And that's how this book was written, was to just say, I don't know if anyone's going to read it because I've written other books and people didn't read those. And so I was like, I'm just going to write this one the way I would write it 
for my legacy, for my children to read someday if they find it on a shelf and are inspired to read it. And because I wrote it that way, and because it was more of a inspirational uh, writing, if you will, uh, that's, that's just how it, it became this manifest uh, thing for me where I was like, oh, this is who I am. This is for real. And, and when you read the book, you'll be like, oh, wow, he's really being vulnerable here. I, I share some stuff about myself that people are like, how could you confess to that in a book? You know, and I go, well, I don't want you to think I'm some perfect guy that keeps every promise. I've broken so many promises to myself. I know the power of keeping a promise. That's why I wrote it. And uh, it really inspires people to say, well, if he's willing to share that, maybe I could share my story. And that's why I wanted to write it that way. Awesome. You know, and like you said, even if, even if no one else reads it, but maybe your kids and that inspires them, then, then you've done your job. You know, you've done what you set out to do. It's just, <clears throat> it's, it's fallen to where it's supposed to be. So I think that's awesome. You know, um, I didn't know it's so cool. My wife uh, served a mission for our church and you know, it's fun to hear the stories of the changes it made just by her example and stuff of, you know, 15 years later, 20 years later, people we've never met, people who may never, ever meet, you know, just that one little thing has fallen or made its way to where it needs to be. So I thank you for sharing that. Um, now, you mentioned there was three parts that you originally tried to write, but it turned out to be one. Is that correct? Did I understand that correct? That's right. Yeah, the, the first one was the promise to our audience, which is our customers, if we're in business. Uh, the second one's the promise to the family, which we would put team that we work with and family at home in that category. And then the promise to the one is the third, which is ourself. That's awesome. So, so do the other two parts of on their works and in the following? <laughs> <laughs> Heck yeah, someday. I mean, I, I've got other projects in the works right now. We're just launching this book and, and it's done well so far and hoping more people want to check it out. You know, of course, we're talking about things like moral fortitude, character, integrity, stuff that some people are like, ooh, I don't want to go there. And other people are like, let's go, you know, or things like habits, self-acceptance. Uh, even I talk about God in the book and the importance of being a disciple in that which we choose to believe and follow. So it's really a book about where we stake our foundation in our beliefs in ourselves and how we can serve the world the best of our capacity. And I teach the ICM process, which is identify, clarify, magnify, and how to discover your signature moves. So there's a lot in this book. And the next book's coming out as they will. It'll just add to it, which I'm very excited. And the publisher says they're on with me for all these books too. So yeah, man, I don't know. I'm excited to see where it goes. That's, that's awesome. You know, I was uh, talking to my sister earlier in the lunch meeting and you know, sometimes in that identifying and stuff, you, um, when you're um, unclear and stuff, sometimes you, your goal is to find your goal. You know, and that's where you have to start is just, okay, my goal is to find out what my goal is. You know, and it could be as simple as that, as uh, square one as that. And, you know, and then you just start and then everything will fall into place. You know, like you said, it's keeping promises to yourself having that belief, whatever that belief may consist of, you know, and then taking that, those steps forward, things will fall into place. So it's a great conversation to have. And, you know, we talk about that in the book. If your listeners are thinking to themselves, okay, here comes 2021, 2020 has been rough. How do I make some new resolutions, some goals for 2021? I, I mean, I might challenge that thought for a moment. I might say to you, why set a goal when we can make a promise instead? You know, so think about some of your goals and maybe you've not reached those goals in the past. Maybe you've set the same ones over and over and that's okay. But we set a goal and we miss it. We just set a new goal. But if we make a promise and break it, we have a problem. So where I like to say that a goal, a, a goal is, or a promise is like a sacred goal. And so goals are like particulars and promises are proclamations. So how can we make our proclamations really great for ourselves, such as if we set a goal every year to lose some weight or something like that, you know, I'm going to lose 10 pounds this next year, something. Now imagine if instead we made a promise to just wake up every day and work out. That's my promise. I don't have to 
choose what outfit I'm putting on in the morning. I just know I work out every morning or I make a promise not to eat any sugar this day, you know, and then we're not tempted because we're like, oh, I promised myself I wouldn't do that. It's very simple. It might sound like semantics, but I think a goal feels like it has an end game where a promise becomes what we are. And so that's where this book really helps us to get to that next level of being somebody who makes a promise and keeps it and it changes the way we live. Like that, you know, I'm, I'm a goal person myself. But one thing I've found is I, I make goals, you know, I, I establish like yearly, weekly, monthly goals and stuff. And I, and then I read them daily, you know, cause otherwise you make a goal at the beginning of the year and it uh, gets buried in a, under the kitchen table or her in the pile of paper somewhere and stuff, then you won't look at it until the last week of December, you know? So I found that uh, going with the promises and those goals, I look at them daily, you know, and then it keeps me thinking about, uh, thinking about where I want to be and what I feel like when I'm going to get there and what I'll feel like, you know, whether it's health or finance or vacation or whatever the case is, I, I picture myself, having accomplished that, you know, and like you say, keeping that promise and it's always on my mind a lot more. So the action is there and it helps and you see progress a lot more instead of just once a year. Yeah. Good for you. And having those goals right in front of you, that's the power of a great goal setter and somebody who is a goal accomplisher. And unfortunately so often we're like, he sets goals. He's a good goal setter. We don't want to just be the goal setter. We want to be the goal accomplisher. We want to be the person who keeps the promise, not just makes the promise. And so, yeah, if you're doing it that consistent, then that's the trick. I, I believe the key to life and success and happiness and all of that is consistency. Consistency in those goals and promises that we keep and make for ourselves. Awesome. And um, to, to go along with that, you know, Often we, we need support system, you know, people are hard to find or people find it hard sometimes to find support. You know, like we could, we could tell them these things and teach them these things, but my, my spouse doesn't support me or my spouse isn't on board with me or my family doesn't think I can do it or, you know, my AP English teacher or whatever, you know, um, and maybe you can add to this a little bit, but something I find is just um, asking. You know, you need support, just ask, hey, even if it's on Facebook, like I'm part of networking groups on Facebook, you know, I'm doing this goal, I need some support, you know, who can help me with this or who can help me with this or who's done there. And then, you know, you, you start somewhere and you start building that network of support and people that are at the next step and that can pull you up and, hey, um, try this or things like that. Um, do you have anything to add to that or what would you add to that? I like the angle you took on that because, you know, I was thinking a different direction. So if you're asking for support and, and creating a network, that is so awesome. And that's a great way to take that route. Then there's somebody like a Michael Jordan, for example, the great basketball player, Michael Jordan, whenever anybody told him he couldn't do anything, his whole thought process was, I'm going to prove him wrong. You know, I'm going to go out and attack my goals. and <laughs> I'm just going to work until I make, them eat their words. So there are different uh, ways in which we can come at that question. And I like actually the way that, that you went for it first. That's very cool. And yeah, having this support network, that makes all the difference in the world. Um, because if we're only going after something to prove someone wrong and we're angry about it and all that sort of thing, then we'll always have that sort of resentment and chip on our shoulder. And if we, if we live our lives that way, eventually we get to a space where we can never be satisfied because we're constantly trying to prove everyone wrong. Rather, if we're asking for help and, and helping others to share their gifts and signature moves in order to help us keep our promise, then everyone does together. And there's no one set path for everybody, you know. Um, you, your approach might be a little bit different than mine, a little bit different than Sally's, a little bit different than Bob's. You know, so there's a little bit of piece of these all different aspects and stuff that play into it. And um, something else of saying that I've heard that I really like to go along with that is, you know, not just to prove other people wrong, but it's to prove myself right. I think if you, um, you might start with, I'm going to prove them wrong, you know, and that might be the starting point to get you going. 
But I think if you um, change that and work into the, okay, I'm doing this for me. This is to prove myself right to show that I can do these things and keep these promises. I think it'll drive it further. And like you said, you know, it'll be much more fulfilling. That's right. Yeah. Well said. And the beauty of something like that is it might start in a negative place, but if you've ever written in a journal, uh, I know that if in my journal, I'm spewing, you know, just writing as fast as I can, all the frustrating stuff. What's interesting is when you start with frustration and everything that's wrong, then eventually it sifts into this piece of gratitude where you're like, oh man, I do have way more to be grateful for. And so going into it as a almost negative, which does then turn into a positive, powerful way. I was thinking about that today, actually, when I was eating a bunch of raspberries and I, you know, I, I had the little carton and I dumped them into the bowl and then I sprinkled them off with the water and washed them off. And I was looking at the raspberries and I'm eating the raspberries that were like the biggest, juiciest, yummy ones. And then as I'm, as I'm looking at the, them just slowly, you know, withering away into my bowl. And then I'm looking at the bottom of the bowl and I saw all these little puny, pathetic looking raspberries. And I thought, you know, if that would have been what I would have, you know, had in the bushel at the very beginning, I probably would have just eaten those raspberries and been happy with it. But instead I had this heaping bowl and I just ate them all until whatever was left was left. And, and it's interesting that as I looked at the measly ones at the bottom, because I didn't have the yummy juicy ones still, the measly ones, now they looked good. So then I ate those too, you know? <laughs> and so it just depends on our perspective where we come from. Oh yeah, perspective it can be huge. So awesome, I like that, uh, like that little story there. Um, uh, one more question. Where can people find you? You know, if they wanted to connect with you, um, learn more about you, um, your book, where are some places they can connect with you? Yeah, so I'm pretty active on social media. I mean, if you want to go to Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, Twitter, YouTube, I'm all over there. Uh, my name is Jason Hewlett, like Hewlett Packard. And I have a website, jasonhewlett.com. But yeah, I'd be really thrilled if people are interested in checking out the book. The book will really change your life, change the way you live each day. Um, it'll really upgrade your living in the sense of you can make more money, you can feel more happiness. I mean, I'm not promising you those things from the book, but I know that if you apply what's in the book, you could do that for yourself. And so that would be great if we could uh, be in touch that way. Awesome. Thank you. And we'll drop those links in the, the comments with the video as well. Um, and also with the audio. Again, Jason, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for taking the time and sharing your experiences and um, your knowledge and wisdom. It's been a great conversation. I've loved having you on. So thank you again for being here. Thanks, Kenny. I, I dread no Mondays, but I do know that, uh, you know, life is so beautiful. If we, we make of it what we will, and it's all part of our promise. So thanks for keeping yours. It's been great. Oh, thank you. And everyone for tuning in, thank you for tuning in. And please reach out. Let us know how we can help you dread no Mondays.